Today, we're happy to have a guest speaker here. His name is Barry Fisher, and he's been with NRCS for 39 years. And since 2014, he has been the team leader of the, soil, the Central Soil Health Division. And that's kind of when the, the big soil health movement really got momentum, and so they created Soil Health Division. So we're happy to have him here, which is that's based out of Central Indiana. And he's also a farmer in, Central Indi in West Central Indiana with his wife, and he uses no-till and cover crops, and he also grazes livestock. Um, so basically, he is practicing what he preaches, so that makes it even better to hear from him. The, the, the farmers that I have right there in my home, West Central Park, we've had a, a, like a network for a long time, and uh, we've been working on a lot of these practices, these no-till practices and cover crop practices, and so a lot of the things that I I talk about are a culmination of the things that we've tried locally. We get together all the time throughout the year and, and talk about things and solve problems. But then now, once I've, I've been able to expand uh, the territory, I go all over from North Dakota to Kansas, back all the way to Pennsylvania. So most of the Corn Belt, most of the Great Plains, uh, I'm, I'm uh, getting to come in contact with a lot of those really, really good farmers all over. So. So you just you just build that bigger network, and and so you find you find more answers to more problems, and 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 the innovation that I see is just unbelievable. I mean, where we're going with soil health management, and you know everybody's going to have a light, slightly different path based on their weather, based on their location, based on their cropping systems. But the innovation that I'm seeing, and now the absolute just relentless pursuit. Once you figure out that you can truly improve soil function. Uh, and you, you want that to happen, you know, and I know probably there's a lot of you in the room that are having your own journey there and, and really working on, on those improvements on your own farms, and I'd love to hear from it throughout the day uh, any chance that I can, because I, uh, I try to bring good information, but at the same time, I always feel guilty because I always get more than I, I bring. I'm sure I do every single place I go, so, so I love to hear from you. So. Uh, I'm going to start a couple things. Uh, I, I put building soil function. Uh, we've got soil health uh, on in you know all the magazines. You hear see the word soil health. It's on you know uh, all, all kinds of products being sold that, that that have soil health claims. But what we're really talking about is a management system and a, and a management philosophy that, that achieves the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and us. And the key words that we're going to focus on today, of course, we want continued capacity. Those words are important because guess what? Whether it's good weather, bad weather, wet weather, dry weather, we've got to have the soil to function throughout those. That's resilience. So that's really key. But the way we get that is through restoring and regenerating soil functions. Those inherent soil functions that, that, that get us that get us over those humps, you know, that, that allow us to infiltrate water when it comes harder than we want it, and the one then that can hold water longer when the water shuts off. So those are really key functions. We'll, we'll dive into functions here in a minute, but we'll spend a lot of time on, if we're going to regenerate these functions, how do we do it? And we do it with a management system that focuses on that living ecosystem. The only way you're going to regenerate or build soil function is, is, is the living things in the soil and managing for them. Let them do the job that they were, nature intended them to do, and you'll be amazed how much function we get back. You know, there's been some unintended consequences of our agriculture over the years. We've been pretty intensive, you know. We do a lot of disturbance. We do some things that hasn't always complemented the living ecosystem. We're still doing a really good job. And, 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 you know, we've got good production, we've got a lot of good technology and science that helps us, but what if we could really restore the inherent soil functions and add that to our technology and our genetics and everything? Now you'll really see what the, the real potential is. Okay, so that you get to see that. And I'll, I'll give you some examples how we see it on a regular basis on the farm. But when I talk about soil functions, give me some soil functions that you think a soil ought to, I alluded to a few here, what are some soil functions you'd really like to have improving on your farm? Water holding capacity. Water holding capacity. Water's everything, especially on an undulating topography and in, in, in weather extremes, right? If you're going to hold water, what do you got to do first? 
What function do you need before holding it? Reduce tillage. Reduce tillage, but what's the function we're after? We, we want rain to get in the soil first, right? Instead of running off, right? Anybody that's ever heard Ray Archuleta, he always talks about, we don't have a runoff problem, we have an infiltration problem. You know, we, we've kind of become complacent, and I'm as guilty as anybody that when we get, well, I had that two inch rain last night, what are we gonna do? Well, what we're gonna do is regenerate soil function, so we've got true infiltration capacity, we've got aggregate stability to the soil, so that when it rains two inches, it doesn't have to run off. We think it does, but it does not have to. You know, years and years ago in eastern Ohio, in Coshocton, Ohio, they had long-term no-till plots on, on like 12 to 15 percent slopes. And once those were in place for years and years, they had lysimeters underneath and everything. Do you know that they couldn't even make that water run off of those 12 percent slopes? They got to a point where they, they, they could not even, as much rain as came, it just went in. And, and, and that's the inherent potential of a lot of these soils. Your soils are inherently a lot better than Eastern Ohio, I'll just tell you that. So, so, so we're gonna talk about soil functions and, and the way we kick it off is most of us are visual, okay? We, we just are, we're visual learners who have to have a visual impact. And a lot of you people have seen this uh, slake test or aggregate stability test. And, Neil brought some soil from right here close by in this, this part of the world. Neil, tell us about sure. tell us about the, the soil and the management of that soil. Yep. And I'll, uh, I'll this, hold them up while we're doing this. This is actually uh, Fayette soil from Fayette County where I, where I live. So, but y'all have a lot of Fayette soils here, ridge top, lust soils, blue in. Uh, the management on them, one, as we sort of look at the, the roll up chart over there, and the soil health principles, the one has all the principles except for livestock. It currently doesn't have livestock. Uh, I hope to add some, but not yet. Uh, it's no-till, it has a crop rotation, it has cover crops, live roots year-round, plant diversity, all those good things. The other one is only about 100 yards away, across the road, uh, on a neighbor's farm. Great guy, he doesn't care that I grab his soil out of there. Uh, but he does use a lot of tillage and he only grows corn. So it's, it's a very intensive tillage system with a monoculture, monocrop, so. So we have, when we have a management system with these four principles in place, what we're developing is a habitat for those soil organisms. That living ecosystem gets to do its full capacity. And as those organisms go through their life and have food and have shelter and have all the things that living organisms need, as they go through their life, you know, they, they grow, they eat, they sweat, they poop, they reproduce, they die, and all the time that they're doing those things, and, and not just bacteria, but there's, there's uh, all different kinds of things, especially the fungus and the, the mycorrhizal fungi, and, and there's really beneficial things, long chain organisms that are still microscopic, but as they're doing these processes, they're putting out glues, they're ex exuding glues, you know, just think of worm slime, you know, that along a worm, you know, they got a slimy edge. Well, these, all these organisms produce some of that, and those biological glues are constantly, uh, as, they're, as they're coming out in, into the soil, they're wrapping around the sand, silt, and clay, and the mineral parts of the clay, and the organic matter in the clay, and they're protecting that, and those glues are actually water stable. Okay, they're, they're, they're water stable. And, and so what it does is it provides ag uh, stable, water stable aggregates and if they're water stable then they, they leave pore space open between them, okay? And so they'll allow air and water to move in and out without blowing up. If you don't have those glues, if you do a lot of tillage, you don't provide a lot of food, you have a lot of disturbance, you allow heat and uh, ex uh, weather extremes to hit these soils, those glues are either eaten by the bacteria or, or they're, just, they're just not allowed to stay there, okay? So, so then you've just got free clumps of soil minerals sitting there that aren't protected. You don't have aggregate stability, okay? And so what we have then is a soil that either has a good relationship with water, air and water moves freely in and out without them blowing up, or you have a soil that doesn't have a good relationship with water, and when it comes in contact with water, it's very disrupted, okay? So I'm just gonna drop these in here, or, or 
I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and go ahead. Just, just put them in there. Get it down to a size that I can deal with here. Okay. And uh, we just put these, you know, these are two different soil, the same exact soil type under different management. This is the one that has been managed for that living ecosystem. And this one has been managed uh, uh, with a little, well, quite a bit more disturbance, not as much cover, those kinds of things. So, so there's not as, not as much biological, biological habitat uh, around there. Okay. So when you just put these in water, it becomes very evident, very quick, which one has a better relationship with water. And, and you know, we can keep adding some uh, to this. The, the difference is. See, the, the bubbles are going in, the bubbles are coming out, so that means air's going in there. This isn't just some old hard clod. This is air, the water's going in there and pushing the air out. But as the water went in and the air came out here, the aggregates weren't stable, so they blew apart. And they blew apart into this, what's clouding up the water? Even if we break these off, you know, or put, put some smaller ones in there, see, when they go down, they're not falling apart. They're not clouding the water at all. They're stable aggregates, okay? And so, if it's, if, it's, if it's clouding up, what part of the soil is clouding that up? If there's sand, silt, and clay that are mineral, make up the mineral portion, what, what's, what's saying suspended mostly? Silt and clay, right? What do we know about clay? What, what, what do we, are, is clay good to have in the soil? What's it do for us? Holds water, holds nutrients, and holds other products, chemicals maybe, that, that are designed to, to stick to that negative charge, right? And so anytime the clay is suspended, it's subject to running off. If it's running off, it's taking very valuable parts of our soil away with it, right? Now let's say we just got flat soil. I don't have steep soil, I got flat soil. I don't have an erosion problem, right? If you got flat soil, you don't have an erosion problem, right? NRCS people, help me with the, the process of erosion. There's three steps. What's the first one? Detachment. Detachment. Second, did we get detachment? Transport. Did we get transport, though? If it's flat soil, does it transport? Where to? And then where does it deposit? In the pore space that you really needed left open, right? The right below, just right there. So when you get detachment, transport, and de deposition into the pore space directly below, when that soil dries out, what do you have? Crust. A crust. What happens the next rain? Does it go well? It's sealed off, right? And this happens, you saw how quickly this happens. This happens the first rainfall event. If your soil is not stable, it does that immediately. And even on pretty gently sloping land, if water can't go in, if water can't go in without that soil falling apart, it's going to find the lowest spot in the field. A lot of times we see those ponded areas and say, well, I must have a compaction problem there, right? You probably didn't have a compaction problem there. You probably had an aggregate stability problem and an infiltration problem on the rest of the field. If, it, if, if every raindrop got to go in right where it landed, we would never have a ponded part of the field, would we? We'd just go in. And believe it or not, that, that's not just pie-in-the-sky dreams. That's very possible for most of our soils if we restore and regenerate aggregate stability. So that's the number one indicator as farmers and as planters that we need to be looking for. As we're trying to regenerate and rebuild soil function, we're looking for aggregate stability because that's the first step in making soils perform at their highest level. Okay, we're looking for high performing soils and, and restoring some of these, these things. So the rest of the day, this kind of gives you a visual. We'll look at this, kind of refer back to this because this matters to us. This is real. This, is, this takes soil health that kind of may be just a feel good thing to real soil function and then we can tie it to real productivity and real, real resilience to our farming operation. It becomes real. It's not foo-foo anymore, right? Okay, question? I was giving the earthworms credit for the infiltration improvement. Uh, 
and they help. Is, uh, could you uh, quantify that, the, the benefit of earthworms compared to this concept? Earthworms are just part of the whole ecosystem. They make bigger holes, they make macropores, but, and then, but they also then line their holes with that ooze and with all that organic matter and, and a lot of really good nutrients. So they provide a really nice easy path for roots to get down through and water and air. But you've got to have the aggregate stability between those earthworm holes so that water and air gets into the matrix of the soil. Follow me? That's why you need the help of those other organisms. Even if you've got earthworms, we may or may not be managing for all of that ecosystem and it's important to make sure all those other microscopics and, and some of the smaller organisms are very beneficial too. Okay? Earthworms are, are beneficial to us, but, but we, we want all of that matrix of the soil to be stable. There was a meeting up in Duke either last week or whatever. They were talking about knowing your soil and the mycelium. Is that the correct pronunciation of that? Mm -hmm. Is that mycelium coordinated with what you're speaking of? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fungi. The, the, the so where was that in relationship to your program? It, it, it's, it's all part. Th those beneficial fungi have, 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 have a major play. They actually attach and infect and go inside the root walls, but they're so small they can go, they can go out into the soil matrix and go inside these aggregates and find water and nutrients that a hair of a root could never get. And so most of our row crops have this relationship with, with mycorrhizal fungi and, 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 and other organisms like that to symbiotic organisms that are bringing them nutrients and water that the, the root itself could never get to. That's why we'll get to it in a minute, but that's why these plants, they don't, you know, all this photosynthesis synthesis that they do and all the sugars that they make and proteins that they make, they don't just keep them all to themselves. They give away a considerable amount of them. In, they, it bleeds out into the soil through the root walls to attract more of those organisms that, guess what? In nature, doesn't give many things away, right? So that plant is giving that away so that those organisms bring things back that that plant needs, that it may not be very good at getting on its own. It's a symbiotic relationship, okay? And so the, the, that's why on our new soil health tests, we send those samples off and we wanna know what, what is the kind of the makeup of some of the biology. Is it all bacterial? Or do I have some fungal, beneficial fungal communities starting to come back in this, in this soil and, and stuff like that? And that's, that's you know, we could spend a whole day on just, just the biological testing that we're now learning, learning about and developing in, in labs and, and in universities. And our, our, soil health, our, our folks out in, in Lincoln, Nebraska are working on with, with NRCS. So good question, good comment. But keep all those living things in the back of your mind as we talk about, because we've got to manage so that they do well. Okay, it's going to be, it's going to take some changes in our management to, to bring about that habitat that helps those organisms out. It, it doesn't have to be management that costs us lots of money. It can, if we know how to do it and the logical steps to get it done, then, then, then we can actually capitalize on that. It doesn't have to bite us. Yeah, you had a question right here in front and then back there. Uh, I was wondering, um, do standard soil tests test for this type of thing or do you have to have a special thing to They're starting to. They're starting to. I, was, I actually was on the phone this morning with uh, some of the folks that are affiliated with Land Lakes and their testing labs that they, they've recently bought the lab and I wish I could remember the name of it that ultimately Monsanto had bought first, then Bayer had it, and then now I think Land Lakes has bought it back from them, that they were set up to do some of these biological tests in addition to their chemical tests. And I know, you know, Brookside Labs is now ramping up to do it. Most of the big testing labs are looking at this, and they're at least going to try to do respiration. They're probably going to do some aggregate stability tests, and they're probably going to do some maybe protein tests and some of those things. So. They're going to start ramping up so that when you send in your soil sample, you'll be able to get some additional 
some of these new tests done. They're, the labs are going to figure out that this is this is important, and if as long as it's economic, they'll do it, right? You know, that's how business works. Right here, please. How does, if you're going across the field, you run different soil tests, or uh, different types of soil, mm -hmm. you know, how do you compensate for stuff like that? It, well, every soil is different, but I will tell you this, every soil that I've ever come across, every soil type has the ability to improve function and, and, and build this, even pretty sandy soils. I've seen very sandy soils that with just a little bit of organic matter and, and some of that new organic glues that are out there, if the management's right, they'll just hold up just fine. And you know, just come up here at the break, stick your finger down in there. That's not an old hard clod. Don't, don't mistake that what you're seeing for an old hard clod. It's soft as can be. The water's all the way in it and all the way through it. So it's, it's just got those glues that are holding that together. That, we'll talk about more functions, but that, that's real strength though, even for our equipment. It'll hold our equipment up. It helps prevent rutting up fields and all this. And there are more benefits other than just water holding capacity. There's nutrient cycling that's, that's part of that new pool of organic matter and, and, or, and, and living things and stuff. So anyway, let me, let me move on and we, we talk about, we've got these principles here and you've seen these. I've got four there, there's five up here. I'll talk about why, why there's five. Sometimes you hear about five, sometimes you hear about four. But uh, as we get into the slides, I don't know, maybe that would be, can you see that better maybe? Yeah. It's kind of a, a light room and Quite honestly, I'm sitting here looking out. I'm, I'm, it, it's a nice. I'm glad it's a little bit of a bad day because otherwise I'd be probably distracted looking outside. <laughs> it's bad when you're the presenter and you're you're the one that's distracted, right? That's not going to go well. Uh, so we've got this principle. If I was going to manage for that living ecosystem to achieve this, there are four principles that we've that just anywhere you go, almost in the world. These principles, if these are management principles in the back of your mind and you consider them every, with every operation and every management decision you make, you start having a system that, that develops that habitat, right? So, so if we have a system that minimizes disturbance, and of course that looks a lot like no-till or strip-till or something like that, uh, and that's the physical side of disturbance we would like to cut back on as little tillage as possible, but keep in mind that there's other disturbances. There's chemical and there's biological disturbances. So just keep in mind that chemical disturbance are, can, can also uh, be a play as far as uh, what we do for the living organisms. You know, there's things that we do, chemical or biological, that, that can be a, a, a biological disturbance, you know, can, be a, can, can, can mess up that ecosystem. So we'll get, dive into that a little more. And sometimes in our corn bean rotation, you know, even if we've got a, maybe a no-till system or almost no disturbance, some of our crops don't produce much cover, right? And, and while, while you've minimized disturbance, some of that soybean year or after the soybean year, there's still a lot of light and exposure to the wind and water forces that, that can uh, start to degrade some of those aggregates and kind of tear down the house. You know, every, every habitat needs a good shelter over it, you know, and, and if we don't have the protection and that blanket cover to, to, to slow down the extremes in, in heat and, and cold and things, then, then that's not going to maximize our, our, our habitat out there, okay? So these are kind of the protection side of this equation, but if we're really going to start regenerating some of this, these soil functions, then we're going to focus on food because it's the plants through photosynthesis and those root exudates that feed the organisms, right? So if that's what feeds the organisms, they use the free sunlight energy, the CO2, the carbon, they put that carbon into compounds and every plant has a slightly different compound so that exudate is a slightly different food. It's kind of like, are we gonna eat nothing but, but uh, hamburgers and french fries or are we gonna have a nice buffet with a lot of different things on it, okay? So that's why we talk about maximizing diversity. So you already see why there's, there's kind of a push on some of this adding cover crops to our row crops. That's going to give us more cover, and that's going to add some, a different crop type, different root type, and, and add some diversity. 
And if that feeding, if that's the mechanism that feeds the soil, then having more roots living there more of the year is also going to feed more organisms, right? Think about your corn for just a second. When it grows, when does the root system really get to take it off? What month? June? It might start in May if it's a good year, but, but, but mostly June, it's really growing, really expanded. When roots are really growing and really expanding, that's when they're putting out a lot of exudates and they're really feeding because they're recruiting all this, all this biology to come bring them stuff, you know? So, there, so as it's growing, the, the root exudates are there. And then they continue growing through July, pretty good. We're still putting out roots until what happens at the end of July? What plant happens physiologically with that plant? Switches gears, right, to what? Reproductive. Now, in nature, would it have made sense for a, a plant or anything to continue giving lots of resources away when it goes reproductive? Or would it be better at that time to kind of start holding on to some things and put it in energy into seed and that reproduction process, right? That would make more sense in nature. And that's what happens. So think about it. If, if it starts shutting down what it's giving away by late July and early August, that's kind of two and a little bit more full months that we're really feeding. But there's a lot of year left. There's a lot of sunlight left. There's a lot of chances if we get that. That's where these cover crops start making a major play and such a major complement to no-till systems and things if we're truly trying to regenerate and rebuild some of this organic matter and some of this diversity. See, so, so, they, so these principles have, have some, some basis. Under the diversity, though, notice there's a lot of people will put grazing down here. Now, I, I tend to want to make sure the principles that these will work everywhere, and these are kind of must-dos if you think you're really going to build soil health, these four principles. But I'm going to suggest that if you can, under this biology, under this maximizing diversity, if you really want to stimulate and add more diverse food and, and cycle it faster and make it more available, anytime you can integrate the animals into the system. Now where we're at, we get enough moisture and as you move south and east of here, you get more water, it's warmer and more moisture. You get the animal impact from almost nature. You get bugs, you get crickets, you get voles, you get uh, deer and, and turkeys and rabbits and birds and everything, you, you're getting a high percent of what you need in the way of animal because you're really kind of using them to break down and process the carbon. But as you get this far north and start moving west to where it gets drier, you can see why those folks say that's a must do. If you talk to the Dakota folks, that they, they'll say this is a must do because of their weather conditions and the amount of carbon and stuff that they don't have as much opportunity for nature to break down and process that carbon so the livestock becomes an integral part of building this system. Follow me how that, how that is, a, is a play, but it will help almost anywhere if you can do it and it's practical and it's logical. Adding the livestock component is a really good thing. Okay? And it'll, 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 it'll enhance the whole, whole deal. So, okay, I've got these principles up there. They all sound kind of good, but if I'm a farmer out in the room, I, I want to just, I said earlier, I said, I, I, I think you've all seen the validation of those four principles. I think you've seen that it's real production, it's real beneficial, it's real resilience. And I'm gonna, this, this is what I use a lot of times. Here's an enhanced photo we use from our infield advantage program that uh, Indiana corn helps us with, with that in Indiana. And, and uh, you guys may have had a similar program, but we use enhanced photography. That means green's greener, yellow's yellower. And what's yellow mean to corn? Is that good or bad for health, crop health? Yellower is, means you're, you're starting to strag, struggle just a little bit with something. So it pop, makes that pop, and, and it pops right where you think it would. Sides of hills. It's had some erosion over the years. It's thinner soil. Maybe it's not got as much water. You see the drainage areas. There's more organic matter there. There's more water, there's deeper soil, so the crop health looks better, right? So there's really nothing here that's, that's out of the ordinary. This is all real dark here behind the barn. We don't know why that would be darker green and healthier behind the barn, but, but that's, that's an anomaly, right? But, but, but these drainage areas, 
Uh, you know, it all, every, there's really nothing except this one thing that goes up and down and up and down and it stays dark green all the way through. All the way through. Can you all see that? Good crop health all the way through. What, what are we seeing there? That the old cow lane. Could be. What else maybe? That's the property line map. What probably was that then? Oh, the fence line. It's a fence line. It's a, and since it's a property line, it's probably been a fence line for a while. Anybody got yield monitors on your combine? Everybody go across an old pasture or an old fence line? What's your yield map look like right there? I'm seeing thumbs like this. It just jump a couple bushels or? It jumps a lot. It jumps a lot, it jumps a lot. Well, let's talk about this fence row for just a second. You've all seen it. You're all, you, get, you get where I'm going with this now, right? That fence row, since it was a property line, that fence row was there for, for quite a while. Now it's gone. It's being farmed now. Maybe the, the farm got bought and they're all one farm now. The fence row came out a while back, but it was there for quite a while. Let me ask you about that fence row. Was, was that fence row disturbed very much? Did it have pretty good cover on it most of the time? How about a continuous living root? How about some diversity? Maybe it was straight broom grass, I don't know, but it, but it, but it, 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 it probably had multiple species growing in it for a long time. It had those four principles in place for a long time and we weren't necessarily fertilizing that more. We weren't doing a very high management with that. But what we've got is an area of the field that if you put it in this jar, it would, it would hold like this. It would have good aggregate stability still. The organic matter would be really good there probably. If you did a soil test, the organic matter would be really good there. And that is, that is transferring to high soil function. High soil function brings about resilience and productivity. And so when I talk to farmers, nobody, everybody says, Fisher, when I go to my landowner, he wants me to rent the whole farm, not just the fence rows, okay? But what if now, if we've got those four principles, what if we can manage for the fence row effect across the whole farm? If we knew how to do that, could we achieve some of those benefits? Now, a lot of you in this room, I'll bet you have, whether it was accidental or purposeful, have figured out that you can manage to get the fence row effect across the whole farm. Here's a farm that a good friend of mine, that is just not, not far from where I live and farm, but he, he likes to fly, so he goes up and takes pictures. And uh, this used to be Grandpa's farm. This was all one farm a couple generations ago. And uh, you know, when Grandpa leaves uh, to the big farm in the sky, sometimes farm split and management changes too, right? Goes two different ways. And you may have just act, he may have just accidentally, in, in fact, I know Jack really well. He was, a lot of the, why he went to a no-till and strip-till system was a labor issue. You know, he, his kids went off to college and they really were really smart, so they went and went on to, and, and got really good jobs, you know, and, and, and uh, didn't come back right back to the farm. And so he was kind of needing to figure something out. And then, you know, so, so for about 30 years now, it's been in continuous no-till and, and cover crops. Uh, well, the cover crops came probably about 15 years ago, and now he puts cover crop every opportunity that he possibly can. He's got good nutrient management. He's got all that going on. But in a really tough year, when there's, when there's either not enough moisture or too much moisture, in this particular case, it's actually, it was, it was a, a too much moisture thing as much as anything else, I think. But here he's got, what would you say the overall field difference in yield might be at the end of the season here. He talked to his neighbor, you know, and I think, uh, you know, it's always nice to talk to your neighbor, especially when it looks like he might be having a bad, bad year. You'd see him in the coffee shop, what happened over there with that field, Cousin Eddie? <laughs> you know, I don't know if his Cousin Eddie is, but you know, the neighbor, the neighbor, you know, so he, he, he asked what it yield, and he just said about a 40 bushel yield difference. And if a 40 bushel yield difference, say this was 2012, what were crop prices in 2012? Would that make you think this is worth pursuing if you got that much difference in that year? Because this, this, this yielded just right up with the, the normal, his normal average yields that year. Okay? But this one certainly didn't. Do you know how many years back? 
it was split. <clears throat> huh? How many years he was doing no till? How many years that, that, that was split? It, it, it was probably 25 plus years when this picture was taken, and it's probably you know so so he had been in this system for for probably 25 years, a, a no till strip till system, and then had cover crops for about 10 years, but. This is probably what everybody in the room would call conservation tillage. It's not like he's out there mold board plowing everything or anything. It's 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 mulch till, you know. It's not like it's, but he's out there, you know. He's disturbing that soil every single year, you know, with something. So. So how many years do you think, in terms of organic matter, would it take for that neighbor to raise organic matter levels to get the same results? You would start getting that results before you would see. The organic matter number on your soil test change very much. That's a number that's mostly measuring humus. It's a loss on ignition. It's that really stable. But as you start building the 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 new pools of organic matter, the new biology and things, they start rebuilding soil function way before the numbers change. Do you follow me? Yes. I've seen I've seen functional change happen in one season. You know, it, it's just. These, these are central Indiana soils. They kind of want to be good. You know, we got soils out here. These, these soils really want to be good if you just kind of give them a little bit of what they want and, and let that biology take off. They start immediately, start trying to aggregate that soil. And I'll show you at the end of the, the talk here how pretty quick in one corn bean cycle you can make a, a, a major shift in soil function pretty quickly. Now it's just going to keep getting better. Of course, after 20 years, you've really, really now got a very stable, talk about risk management. These guys just don't ever get a claim. You know, they, they, it just it doesn't matter. We had a really, really rough year in our area this year, but there was a lot of record yields. But in the middle of the season, you would have never believed we were going to get the kind of yields we, we did. <laughs> uh, let me go through a real quick management scenario, a couple, couple management scenarios, and then we'll take a quick break. But, but I want to just say, talk about a system. It, keep, those, keep those principles in the back of your mind, and let's start putting a system together that would maybe meet some of those principles, okay? So we already talked about no-till. Notice I put the word quality in front of that. That just tells us that no-till is not a thing, right? So as you're looking at no-till, you may have tried no-till or you even know somebody about no but no-till is a system that you have to know some things to get it to work right for you. And then if you start no-tilling, you need to adapt your nutrient management. Your four R's that were working really well and doing the right thing in conventional tillage might need to be adjusted and adapted a little bit to complement now a no-till system. They may need to be adapted more if we add cover crops because cover crops are going to change the biology. And I'll get into why that's important in a minute. But, and then the cover crops have to be prescribed. Not any old cover crop will do, but the cover crop needs to be selected <coughs> and managed to complement the crop rotation. What crop are you going to plant the cover crop into and what's coming next that you want to complement with that cover crop, right? And then now you've got to adapt your weed and, and pest management just a little bit to, to handle this new system. You're going to scout for different pests than maybe you would have, but you're also going to be just as good at scouting for beneficial organisms as you are pests, okay? So that's a whole new, whole new realm that you've got to got to consider. The good news is we've got really good technology. This is not as hard as it used to be because we've really got precision technology and, and new genetics and new things that really help this system play out, okay? But the whole system needs to kind of be complementing each other. Seldom do you want to just, boom, I'll just try this and see how it goes. Because if you didn't, if you, if you know that that changed something over here and you didn't adapt that, then this didn't really have its full chance to succeed. Follow me? Okay, and I see that a lot, you know, where people just try a thing. Okay, so let's go through real quick on just no-till, what I mean by quality no-till, and this is just one thing. We would maybe do a whole session on, on just nothing but a quality no-till system and go through equipment and all this kind of stuff, and you guys have probably been to some of those workshops. Quality no-till, what I mean by that is every planter setup is critical, it, uh, maintenance is critical. It's more critical because it's the heart of the system. You don't get to park your park your uh, planter in the fence row at the end of the season and let it sit there till next year. You know you gotta you got it, It's more critical in a no-till system that that's 
up to speed and, and, and highly maintained. And, and uh, your goal in no-till, just like it is any place, is every seed needs to be placed exactly the same depth, exactly the same spacing, and exactly the same environment so that it has access to the exact same resources as its neighbor. Corn performs really well when they all emerge the same day, all grow at the same rate, and have access to the same resources, okay? If a corn plant comes up later, that goes badly, right? We'll get to that in a second. But So in no-till, is this possible? What if I got an old planter? I, I can't do this, I got an old planter. Everybody with the add-on aftermarket stuff, everybody can achieve this. I don't care what you're planting through, what brand, what color planter you're is, we can fix a planter to get a perfect stand if we want to, if we know how to. And, and so I, I don't be satisfied that, well, you know, it didn't get as good a stand, but it was no-till. Don't, don't think that way. Expect the best. And, and you got to know that the no-till system starts in the fall, okay? And if it starts in the fall, we've got to spread our weight, we've got to carry our weight a little, little wiser, and then now, we, if we know to order it, we know we can spread the residue. Even if we've got a 40-foot bean head, we can get that spread completely even with the equipment we've got available, but we have to know to ask for it when we go to the dealer. Because I'll just tell you, no offense to any of the dealers, they aren't always versed in exactly what you need for this system and how important it is. That might be an extra $4,000 add-on, you know, to, to get a, a, what I call a European-style chaff spreader and, and, and residue spreader. The Europeans demanded it a long time ago because they were growing that 150 bushel wheat with all that residue, and so they had better spreaders. But now we can get those here if we know we order them. And it might be an extra four or $5,000 over what you were going to get, but in the whole grand scheme of things in a combine expense, that, that will pay you back over the, over the life of that combine, okay? It's more important to have those things if you're going to now be, be no-tilling through that crop residue. You've got to have flotation. You've got to operate your grain cart wiser, okay? Any grain cart operators? Anybody got grain carts? Neil's tired of hearing this, hearing this from me. I like this one. Have you, have you, read, the, have you read the manual of your grain cart? I got a green card. I read the manual. I knew it had to be in there someplace. Who knows what section it's in where it says, this green card must be driven on every square inch of every farm, every field, every year. <laughs> and the only time you pull it is when it's full. <laughs> Guys aren't that bad, but I do see a lot of just random driving around all over the field. Which, which pass with a heavy piece of equipment causes the most compaction? The first, the second, or the third, or fourth, or which one causes the most compaction? The first pass. So where should that grain cart ever be driven? In those combine tracks right there, if at all possible. And it's okay to just go to the end with the empty cart and be filling on the way back to the truck. Okay, so that you never have a full cart at the end of the field. I have guys that they work out their fields if they can at all so that they start and, and, and so that they're conscious about filling that cart on the way back to the truck. That's when you're not tilling anymore, you start thinking about some of those things. Man, it might be better if I didn't do that. You know, so, so anyway, I'm just saying the no-till system starts in the fall and there's a lot of fit thoughts. The beauty is our, our planters, we, we can actually adjust the down pressure with these hydraulic down pressure and some of these aftermarket things. We can go across a dense part, maybe an old wheel track of something, and in sub-inch increments change the down pressure to where it needs to be so that we're absolutely still putting that seed exactly the same depth as its neighbor. So the add-ons and the, the technology is so good today. And even if you've got an old planter and can't spend money on this, there's ways to set up your planter so that, so that you don't just crank the down pressure down as hard as you can go to give you sidewall compaction. There's ways to manage that planter now so that you're not having to to put so much down pressure to get cut through the residue and, and in that. So, so that's a whole planter setup discussion. But if you don't get every seed to come up the same day, you know, there's all this research, it's pretty evident that, that the penalty you pay for that seed, you know, 17 and a half inch stretch a row, if I have three plants that came up five days later, what's that do for yield? In corn, that's significant, right? 
you don't want to tolerate that. You want every seed to come up the same day, and we can. There's no, no reason we can't. So that's what I mean by quality no-till. That's just a snippet. There's lots to, to, more to talk about there, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what I'm talking about when I say quality no-till. How about adaptive nutrient management? Adaptive nutrient management is take your four R's that you've been taught on, on, on nutrient management, right place, right time, right source, right rate. They all start with right. Did you get the R's, the four R's? You got that part, right? So, right? Okay, so, so, but those four R's, when you stop tilling the soil, your four R's, your right rate, or your right place, or your right timing may need to change because you're messing with the biology. And the thing we have to remember about nutrients is all these nutrients are, are, are driven in the soil, okay? So, so here's, a, here's a nitrogen. Let's, let's focus on corn for just a second more. You, some of you folks get tired, but we got the corn growers here, so we've got to focus on corn management, right? So we got nitrogen's important to corn, so here's a typical nitrogen diagram, okay? We've got our inputs. They could be any, any form, whether it's organic or whether it's urea or whether it's anhydrous, whichever it is. And then it goes in, goes through a chemical process, right? Chemical process and reacts in the soil, and now it's, now it's ammonium. Ammonium's pretty stable. If it's a little shallow or if we get it too shallow, it can uh, go through another chemical process, change back to ammonium and, ammonia and, and volatilize. But if it stays there long enough, it generally will go through another chemical reaction called nitrification, and then it becomes nitrate. Once it's nitrate, it can reach away from us. It, we know that. It goes with the water. Or in saturated conditions, or if your soil is anaerobic, sealed off, then it switches. It goes through another chemical reaction called denitrification that can happen pretty quickly in saturated <coughs> anaerobic soils and goes off as a gas, okay? And that's not good. It's lost either way. Okay, so we've got all these chemical reactions going on, and I've, had, I've said the word chemical reaction how many times? Anybody count? Are those chemical reactions? I'm going to suggest they're biological reactions. They're biochemical reactions. Biology is driving every one of these. Biology is driving every one of these transitions in the soil, okay? And so what did we just say right out of the gate we're going to do with biology? We're going to mess with it a little bit, right? We're going to hopefully enhance it just a little bit. We're going to give it a better habitat. We're going to have more of it, more growing, more diverse species. And they're going to change their part of what they're doing with some of our nutrient cycles. And if we don't know that that's happening, that can bite us. If we do know that that's happening, we can use it to our advantage. Okay, and I'll, I'll try to cover that here just real quickly. The thing that we forget is, of the fertilizers that we apply, you know, we can track those with radioisotopes. The, the, the scientists have kind of known this for a long time. It just doesn't get talked about a lot because really we assume that well, the soil is going to do what the soil is going to do and we got to focus on what we're doing with nutrients, right? But the reality is once we start messing with the soil and the biology of the soil, we've changed over half of the nutrient delivery to our crops. Nature set up this thing where the crop and plants get, they put down these roots, they develop this association with the biology in the soil, and that's how plants prefer and want, they will strive to get their nutrients from the soil, the biological reactions in the soil, right? We still have to do as good a job as we can with what we apply, but that's only 50% of the equation. Do y'all get that? That's not something that we all think about a lot, right? As an agronomist, as a lifelong agronomist, that's not something that I spent a lot of my career thinking about or talking about. But once we start messing with the biology a little bit, we're messing with over half of the nutrient delivery to our crop. Here's the short-term effect. This is just one snippet that we have to understand here coming up. If we've been in a full width tillage <coughs> system, and quite honestly, all of our genetics, corn, beans, wheat, doesn't matter, most of our genetics have been pulled and selected from a tilled system, right? That's how we do that. That's how we've done it over our history. So it's not that we've been doing anything wrong, it's just that's where we would have done it. And so over time, the genetics are used to a, the, whatever's normal for a tilled system. That's what they've been selected from. You get that? Okay? So in a 
Well, with tillage system, we can measure microbial activity, and that microbial activity is what's important when we're talking about nutrient cycling and what the biology in the soil is delivering, right? So we can measure microbial activity, and in a conventional system, a more of a full-width tillage system, we get this huge spike <coughs> in microbial activity. And what are we measuring when we're measuring? How, are we, how do we know there's microbial activity? What are we measuring there? If we all got up and started doing jumping jacks, what gas would go up in the, in the room? CO2. CO2. We're measuring respiration, right? <laughs> we're breathing, we're working, we're expanding, there's more of us, we pack more people in here, there's more CO2, pretty soon we start passing out. And that's what happens a little bit here. So, so why is that spiking? Why is the CO2 spiking right here early in, in the season? What just happened? Air. Tillage, we broke apart soil particles, we gave them all new food, we gave them a dose of oxygen and air, and their, the bacteria especially, population explodes out of the gate. And as it's exploding, that bacteria is doing what? It's eating, the, eating, eating food, it's respirating, it's multiplying, it's putting out exudates, and you know, eating, pooping, multiplying, and then ultimately dying, leaving behind what? When they all die, or when they, as they expand and they put out exudates, what well, they given up? CO2. CO2, we see that. Now that's the carbon leaving the soil, right? We are losing carbon in this process. That's where most of our carbon has left. It's partly erosion, but a lot of it's just gone off as a gas through the tillage operation because of all that respiration. But, but as the carbon leaves and these things die off, what else is in that organic matter that they were eating? Plant available nutrients. Plant available nutrients. That's that 50% of the soil. That's where the plants are getting their nutrients. And we got this big dose of nutrients. It was at the expense of our carbon. Okay, it was at the expense of that. And that CO2 left before there was a plant canopy, right? So that nothing caught that CO2. It left, but it did leave behind all these nutrients. And that's the system that we've pulled our genetics from. So our plants, our crops, expect that. Now, if it's a corn plant, what goes on in the first early part of the season? What happens up to, say, the fifth leaf stage? Ear formation. Ear formation, right? Now, if that genetics have all been pulled and they always didn't have to want for nutrients because we had this big flush right there during ear formation, now this now we're, we're going to become a, a, new kind of, a different kind of farmer. We're going to stop tilling out of the blue one day. We're going to stop tilling. We're going to change something. We just messed with the biology, right? We got new biology expanding, new populations expanding. They're hungry. They're, they're growing. It's a little cooler environment. We didn't get a big flush of CO2, so what else didn't we get right there? That big flush of nutrients didn't come, right? Is that a bad thing? It doesn't have to be. It can be a good thing because what does it do? It respires more throughout the season. See that? It respires more throughout the season. So that could be more important for late uptake. The, the water, the, there's more water availability, so it, it respires longer into the season. Now this is just conventional to no-till. What if we add cover crops into this? we'd even probably push that back a little further. So what management technique, what, how are we going to adapt our nutrient management if we expect the same yield? If I'm going to still try to get the same yield, my corn's going to need what it's used to having early when it's developing its ear, or it might not set as big an ear. And if it doesn't set as big as ear, what does it do? How does it not set as big an ear? What, what reduces, potentially? it can drop a couple of rows of, of, of corn, right? If it drops two rows in, around it, do you get those back later? You don't. You might get a little deeper, a little heavier if things go well for you, but a lot of that yield is gone and you don't get it back. So how am I going to fix this management-wise? Can I fix that? <clears throat> yeah, I think you can. That's why you, see, you hear a lot of people talk. Dean Martin's at Iowa State uh, over at the ARS lab in the late 90s, uh, and actually uh, Havlin and them, they, they kind of worked on some of this stuff. 
um, that that uh, they figured out early on that they were trying to figure out why is no-till corn just not making as much as the as as the as the tilled corn, and they were trying to figure it out, and they finally isolated back and said, if we can get Dean Martins even came out with, now I'm not talking about Dean Martins that has the Martini and, and the, the, this is a really good scientist. He, you know, he died an early death and I hate that we lost him, but, but he did some really remarkable things as early as the late 90s and had this figured out. He had a formula. He said, I need 35 pounds of nitrate nitrogen in the first 40 days to fix that issue. And I can do that real easy through UAN solution, liquid, liquid nitrogen, Put more nitrogen in my starter. In fact, they came, went on to say that forget the phosphorus part of that starter. They that the, 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 the nitrogen in the starter was giving them what they needed. And then today, after that, we've got less sulfur from the atmospheres. We now an additional play is that we add sulfur to that starter also, the thiosol. How many guys are doing that? It's been no till in a long time. So words out, right? That benefit. That's how we overcome that. And if we add cover crops to this, that even becomes more important. You might need to even bump that up a little more. So having a starter on your planter is a really worthwhile investment. And even if you don't want to do that, if you're a pretty good sized operator and you don't want to do that, you can, with technology today, with our guidance equipment, we can just do an early side dress operation that's four or five inches off so that that young corn plant gets at that, that nitrate, and why, ni why did he find nitrate nitrogen? Why did he single that out? The microbes in the soil are the first feeders to the trough, and they're very, very competitive for ammonium nitrogen in that cooler environment, okay? They actually can outcompete that young corn plant. Corn plants love ammonium nitrogen, don't get me wrong. However, they also will use nitrate nitrogen, but other things in the soil don't like nitrate nitrogen as well. That's why it leaches. But that young plant, that gives it a competitive edge for the nitrate part. That was the way he explained why the nitrate nitrogen. And that's why UAN Solution makes a, a pretty good product. It still, still turns mostly urea. It's mostly urea and ammonium, but there is that nitrate component. Let's go through real quick, fin kind of finish this system talk a little bit as we add cover crops and why I'm calling that prescribed cover crops. And, 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 and <coughs> for everybody's system and everybody's different parts of the world, and keep it, I, I realize I'm a guy from Indiana that's coming up here. I'm out of, I'm a little out of my neighborhood. So, so here's where you've got management issues that are different than mine. But if we think about the principles and if we really want to get the benefits of these as innovative farmers, we'll figure out a way. I mean, I'm just satisfied that when a farmer wants to, they can. You know, they'll, they'll find a way. So, so let's, let's go through this just a little bit, some of my logic, what I'm talking about when I say uh, prescribed. Right out of the gate, I said the cover crop has to complement the next crop in the crop rotation, and that ties back to that biological nutrient release from the soil. So as we add materials, whether it's a continuous corn rotation or a corn bean rotation, it's the carbon to nitrogen that's changing in that. That's why we get different outcomes even when we change rotations. Now we're introducing a cover crop that could further change the food sources for the biology. And so it's all back to anybody that, that feeds animals, talks about crude protein and, and the amount of carbon, digestibility, the TDN, all this, that's all tied to carbon to nitrogen. Most plants are 40 to 50 percent carbon, right? The only thing that changes the carbon to nitrogen ratio is the amount of nitrogen that's in it, the amount of protein that's in it. So the more nitrogen, the lower the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, right? So that's why down here you see some clovers and, and vegetative plants that have a lower carbon to nitrogen. And if they have a lower carbon to nitrogen, they're going to do they're going to do what as far as cycling nitrogen back and releasing nitrogen into the environment. It's going to be faster, right? Lower C to N, it's faster. See the rabbit over there? That ideally would be a strategy ahead of a corn plant or something that wants that soil to release some nitrogen in a timely fashion, strategically, okay? You notice that even the same species 
are, are quite a bit different when they go from vegetative to almost maturity. And as they go to, to full maturity, they go way up here. Okay? So the more carbon, you know, that you have, the more likely the best fit it's going to be to have a legume crop after that. Because the legume crop can make its own nitrogen. That immobilization that happens with that high carbon cover crop, same thing that happens with corn after corn. That's why, that's why you know, if, if you can put a soybean into a higher carbon cover crop, it will do well, it'll do a lot better because legumes tend to even start fixing nitrogen. The bacteria, they send, they send a signal in a nitrogen deficient environment, they actually send signals out recruiting that rhizobium to start fixing nitrogen earlier. Okay, there's a lot of communication going on. I don't, it's not conscious, but, but there's communication between plants and those microbes that they, they actually go recruiting. They send out hormones and things into the soil that signals start making me some nitrogen. Yep. How do these compare when you harvest the cover crop? Like if you chop the rye off and you just leave the stubble to plant your soybeans? The, it, it, it doesn't change all that much because the roots, by the time it, it's choppable, by the time it gets to that growth stage, the roots, whatever the C, of, C to N is for the above ground biomass, it may even be higher in the roots because these plants are designed to, they need stability, right? So they start pumping a bunch of lignin and higher carbon into the roots. As it gets mature so that it stands, the roots have a, a, actually a higher carbon and you're actually planting that corn down with the roots, not necessarily with the top growth. The other thing to just always keep in mind is that whole cycling of, of nutrients that goes on in the soil, the biological cycling that goes on, also have manure. So they also have high nutrient soils as a general rule. Have, so, so they get away with it better than somebody that had no manure and maybe just a, a medium soil test. If you pulled off all those soil nutrients, those soluble nutrients, and hauled it away when, when that was green, you could have a puny crop right after that, okay? You really want to ramp up your starter fertilizer there in that scenario. See how that goes? You got to just keep remembering that the soil is going to provide over half of those nutrients and, and this plant is very good at getting them. It's the first feeder to the trough. So if you haul it away, haul it away from those areas that have really good nutrients and manure and, and stuff back on it. It works really good. I mean, in that scenario, it, it's a good program. It works. And you've still got the carbon you were after. You were still getting a lot of the soil health benefits from those roots, even if you take the top growth off. Okay? All right. So just a quick st strategy on our cover crops. If we can pull it off, if we can have a strategy, we would try to be thinking a high protein ahead of corn. High protein meaning that because it's going to have the early nitrogen, but it might give it back at a really good time in the late summer. In that vegetative stage, yeah. When it's two foot tall, are you better to spray it and kill it and let it disintegrate down, or like chisel plow it in? Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about that in a second. But yes, there is a point of of time when you got to be a game time manager. You're watching it. You're watching it. When it gets to a certain stage, you you got to really think about should you plant it first and then kill it because because. If you kill it and then you get a rain on very big rye, once rye starts getting very big, now you got wet rope that falls down and it's a quagmire and it's very hard to plant through and it may never dry out. So, so there is a, we'll talk about that in just a minute maybe, but, but, but there is a time when you want to just plant first once that rye starts getting so big. And uh, you, you, once it gets big enough that if it fell over, it would keep the ground really wet and nasty. Once it gets to that growth stage, just to use it in your mind, picture it in your mind, then probably switch and plant first, then kill it immediately after. You want to kill it immediately after that, but the reason is the planter is going to just work a lot better through that standing green rye than it will uh, half dead, ropey, rubbery wet rye. Okay? I hope for rain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you better, you just, yeah, you, Clarity. It, it's, yeah, it's, um, there's all kinds of things that you switch off and, and do different if that happens to you, but, okay, so 
other strategies on that, uh, that whole carbon to nitrogen thing uh, with precision today, we've got a lot of producers that now it's very easy to, to plant and just leave off a row here. And, and talking about those high carbon roots, you know, if I can plant my corn right here, and that seedling doesn't have to fight with all that root mass as, as close to it, that little bit right there is a big play when we're planting corn into, into like a cereal rye, because bottom line, up this far north, cereal rye is going to be your foundational cover crop. You're just going to have to face that fact because that's the one that survives. But there are tricks to the trade with today's technology. That's why I said technology is really going to help us with this if we know to do it. And we've got a lot of studies, a lot of universities are working on this now, and, and the, the immediate results are you still have to have starter fertilizer, but this is a, a, a pretty significant improvement in yield, and you still get m just almost all of the benefits from the cover crop. Follow me. We're still trying to get the benefit, but, but we still want a good yield. Okay, ahead of beans, we can have a lot of that high carbon. I'll remanage that. Why beans do really well in this? They actually are stimulated to set, set nodules earlier in a nitrogen deficient environment, which that would be with all that rye residue there. And, and then you get the better weed control. You know, weed control is a real deal in soybeans right now. And then late season water at pod fill late season nutrients at pod fill. Keep in mind that when a bean gets up to that reproductive stage, it stops, when the roots stop growing, expanding, they stop putting out resources to that rhizobium and they actually stop getting good fixation from the rhizobium late season when they still need a lot of nitrogen. So if you've got this plant, this dying biomass by that time of year and we get a nice little rain, one of those September rains, and the beans are still green, you get a flush of nutrients when it was having a hard time getting any nutrients and nitrogen from the, the rhizobium, at the, the nitrogen nodules at that point, right? So, so, so it, it can have a late season benefit in this scenario, okay? So beans do pretty good in that. And they, they, they will uh, do, do quite well into that environment, okay? Real quick, I'll finish with a, a quick, uh, just a scenario for a corn bean. This just kind of shows, based on what I've already just said, there's a step-in process that's logical. Now, it, it may not be exactly the same for every farm in here, and this, this is just an example that there is a logical step-in based on some of the things I've already talked about, the C to N, the nutrient management, and all these kind of things. And How would I go from a full-width tillage logically and not take a yield bump or a yield hit uh, in this system, okay? How would I logically step in with as little difference and maybe improved economics? So my first operation in this scenario is not where a lot of people would start. I would try to get cereal rye after corn as my first operation. It's a different plant type. I'm starting to diversify. I'm getting cover. I'm getting a living root more of the time. I'm, I'm getting covering that soil over over the winter, and I know that planting beans into cereal rye next year works pretty good. It's pretty easy for a new person to, to plant into that system uh, without, without a major, major train wreck, okay? So my first no-till operation would be I would plant cereal rye into corn stalks. Second, I would plant beans. My next crop's going to be beans because it was corn before. I'm going to plant beans into that. Now, I will try to, you know, since I'm, if I'm new at this, not let that rye just get terribly out of control and scare me to death, but I know that if, even if it is a wet spring and rye gets away from you, those beans, there's beans down in there. Beans will still make 60, 70 bushels per acre, even if, if you have to plant them into that really bad rye. So, so it's not going to be probably a train wreck, even if the rye it gets <coughs> difficult to manage in the spring with the spring rains, okay? If I can, I would plant a cereal, a, a, a soybean that's an earlier maturity group. Now that says, oh my God, early group, that's yield loss. Planting an early group early into this kind of an environment doesn't have the yield penalty that you might think it would when you compare it to plots that have been evaluated in conventional tillage. You're planting it, it's going to be cooler during pod fill, it's going to get moisture during pod fill. The reason we go to long, longer of bean varieties as we can is because they take advantage of late season rains and, and, and the early beans we think are having to fill pods when it's really hot and dry. Well, we've got an environment that, that is more resilient to that in this, so you can get away with it, 
But why am I wanting an early bean planted early anyway? In this strategy, in this step-in strategy. Because the ground's cool for, for, for emergence. Cool for emergence and? Get the next cover crop. You're, you're wanting a better window. Oh. A, a window in the fall to maybe pick from different species. I might be able to get more species or more growth the next fall. Some of those things. I'm giving myself a better window, okay? That's what that's about. And so these beans are probably going to do really good into this rye, so, that, so, so you haven't taken probably, I wouldn't expect a yield hit from your beans in this scenario, but that's my second no-till operation. Uh, and I already went over that. And then third, if I've given myself a little better window, maybe I can get a little more diversity into my mix. You know, I might, I might be able to get a legume, or I might get a brassica, or I might get something else in there that gives me a little more diversity uh, but I can get that cover crop established into the beans, whether I'm flying it into the beans or, or, or planting it after the beans, whatever. I'm going to have a better window to get another cover crop. And if I'm getting more diversity, then I'm building that, you know, I'm working on my diversity part of my, uh, of my management principles. And so this becomes then my, my third uh, no-till operation. And I've got now a whole bunch of different crop types that I'm feeding a lot of biology. It's been continually covered. It's had more continuous roots to feed that biology to start the regeneration of those soil aggregates. And so my first corn crop is actually my fourth no-till crop after a lot of diversity, a lot of cover, a lot of soil improvement has had a chance to take place. I've had a chance to get my planter set up and my, my planting system, my harvest went, I had that in the back of my mind. So my first corn crop had the advantage of, of some, some prep time, if nothing else, and the soil is starting to improve, okay? So now I know that I've got to have starter fertilizer on there. So my first corn crop, I'm not expecting a, a, a yield drag out of that my very first year because it's, it's actually my fourth no-till operation after soil has healed a little bit and has a lot of aggregate stability coming into it. So that, that really helps from a reward standpoint in stepping in. Now, this, this is just a, a way for corn bean farmers you know, that might. Everybody here might have a slightly different step in. You know, if I had alfalfa in the rotation, I would use a whole different scenario to say, uh, what, what is my logical step in here? You know, if I had a way to get full season cover crops, if I was growing some wheat or something like that, I may do it different. But, but just for a basic corn bean rotation, something like this that complemented the things that are going on in the soil and the nutrient things that are going on in the soil is a way to step in with no penalty or a lot less penalty and hopefully make a, a <coughs> immediate gains, okay? So take home message from this morning is lack of cover seldom a good thing. Uh, I, I just got back, we went, my wife talked me into going on vacation. We went down south of Cancun down there and, and I saw firsthand that, that sometimes lack of cover is a good thing, but something, sometimes it's not. <laughs> I can say that it, it was not, a, the lack of cover was not a good thing on this old boy, but, but you know, in nature, lack of cover is seldom a good thing, and, and so uh, most of our organisms are designed to have good protection and good cover. Uh, we've kind of covered a lot of the why, and, and we've got a good farmer panel coming up that can talk about some of the hows, too. Uh, I started down the road on how, it was kind of a logic thought process, how to go get this system integrated and if we if we can get this soil resilience if we can restore some of these soil functions then we're going to be able to take some of these crazy weather extremes and we'll take that two inch rain that happens over the night without a major catastrophe i know that our soils can handle it if we give them the function that they're they're the, they're able to have i just put this up if you google nrcs soil health there's all kinds of farmer interviews We've, we've interviewed a lot of researchers, and, and, and there's webinars on there. There's a lot of really good information on there. But the easiest way to get at it, if you just Google NRCS Soil Health, it'll be one of the top things that comes up. And uh, so there's a lot of resources and stuff uh, on there.